to you for grace, for help, and for strength in this time, Lord. I pray, Lord, that the meditation of my heart be found in acceptable in your sight. Minister to your word of hope, knowledge, and truth to your people this morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Amen. Praise God, you may be seated this morning. And uh, title of the message this morning. Stay in the will of God. I read to you from James chapter 1 verse 22. And it says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror. And afterwards, looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Amen. And so this morning I'm speaking to us about staying in the will of God. Many of us start well, but we don't end well. And so Paul says to run the race that is set before you and you only. And that's found in Hebrews 12, verse 1. And he says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. But you might ask the question this morning, how do I stay on course? How do I stay in the will of God? And we're going to answer that question for you in just a little while. Let me just bring some understanding to this whole thing that will perhaps help you in terms of knowing and understanding the will of God. The will of God is likened unto a path which you need to walk on. The path is not often straight. There are turns in the path. But it behooves you to stay on the path. That is the plan, that is the will of God for our lives. But tragically, as I said, some start in the will of God, but veer off the will of God along the way. And so that's the essence of this message. And so track with me now. In Ephesians 5, verse 17, it says, Wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We see that. Be not unwise, but understand the will of God. I'm going to read a different translation and let it minister to us. Therefore, be not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says, do not act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. That's the will of God. Amen. Are we getting that? Let that sink in this morning. It is of paramount importance to your salvation to know, understand, and execute the will of God in your life for your life. You are automatically saved when you open your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and you welcome Him into your heart and into your life and say you are saved. But you've got to stay on the path. If you veer off the path, you become another casualty like Judas became a casualty. He started well, did not end well. And my prayer is that many in the body of Christ will stay in the course, stay on the course, and end well in the Lord. Hallelujah. So it's of paramount importance. Listen to what the Word says. Matthew 17, 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus. He says, but only those who actually do the will of God in heaven will enter. Those that do the will of God. Now that you have received Christ as your Savior, you must constantly pray, Lord, what is your will for my life? I want to be seen doing your will. I want to be seen praying your will in my life. I want my life to be an expression of your will. It's so important that we pray these prayers. It's of paramount importance to our salvation, remaining saved and staying in the fold. It is important to 
know the will of God because it takes knowing the will of God and doing the will of God to please God. Do we want to please God? Or have we just grown tired and, and this whole harm of Christianity and obeying this and obeying that? Have we grown tired? If we want to please God, then we must be seen as doing the will of God. John chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am He. I do nothing of my own, but say only what the Father told me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases Him. I always do what pleases Him. Can I just challenge you and in a nice way to say, can we commit to doing this on a regular basis? Examining our lives, the direction we are planning, the thoughts we are thinking, the decisions we are making or about to make, and say, Lord, is this pleasing in your sight? Because doing the will of God is what pleases Him. And our Lord said, I always do what pleases Him. I know that it's unfair to look at us individually or corporately and say, are you doing this? I know many of us come short in this regard. But this is a good time to begin, get back in line with God and say, Lord, in light of what I've heard and what I've read this morning, I want that to be the expression of my heart in prayer. I always do what pleases Him. And we have to do this on a regular basis. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. How many of you know that portion of scripture? I know it so well. I read it in different translations. I paraphrase it. I rewrite it, but not to rewrite the essence and the meaning of it. I always paraphrase it so that it becomes part of my culture, my spiritual culture, and I often pray it back to God. So, Let's look at it in a, in, in a prayerful sense where God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. He says, plans to prosper you. What does it mean to prosper you? It means to be blessed, to succeed on every level, on every front. I know the plans that I have for you to prosper you, says God, and not to harm you. God doesn't want to, God doesn't want to allow harm, mayhem, and distraction and destruction to manifest or to take place in our lives. He wants only His best for us. Glory to God. He says, I know the plans. The trouble is we need to know His plans. And so constantly we need to pray, Lord, today, if it's Monday, if it's Tuesday, Lord, I pray in Jeremiah 29, 11 over me. You know the thoughts and the plans that you have for me. Plans to prosper me and not to harm me. Where you find there are trails at these holiday resorts. 
the last one that I visited had a trail. But they give you guidelines. They give you guidelines. And they tell you, follow the trail, and they'll give you like a footprint. Or they'll give you a logo of the holiday resort. And they'll say, follow this. And everywhere you go, you find these little logos, these little footprints. You must follow it. There are other parts available, but they are not approved by the establishment. And if you choose to follow a path that you do not know, heaven knows where you will end up. You must follow the path that has been pre-approved. There are signs on it. God's got a pre-ordained path for your life in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we need to be seen as walking in it. Hallelujah. Praise God. To be willing to take that path, you must be willing and obedient. And then you can pray for the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And you can say, now Lord, bless my coming and bless my going. And he will lead you into pastures green, my friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Let me speak to you a moment about the prodigal son. You might be asking the question this morning, what does this have to do with our sermon series, Give No Place to the Devil? When we walk out of the good and perfect will of God for our lives, you give the enemy access to your life. You give him access into almost every area of your life when you walk out of the will of God. Stay in the will of God. So let me speak to you about the prodigal son. And in the prodigal son, it says in Luke 15 and verse 14, and I'm not going to read the entire text to you, I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, but in Luke 15 verse 14 it says, and he began to be in need. I want us to see very closely this morning that when we make choices and when we make decisions that take us away from God and off the straight and narrow wall, it does not appear to be obvious the day you make the decision. When the prodigal son packed up his bag, everything looked the same. The sun was in its usual place. The workers were working in the field. There was no obvious sign to say, you are doing the wrong thing. It still looked like he was doing the right thing. And so he packed his bags. And there was still no sign, no evidence to say you're doing the wrong thing. And he packed his bags and he left with all his money. And the Bible says he began to spend. And he began to spend. And he began to say, and it didn't look like he's doing the wrong things. It says he had a good time. Does it not say in the Bible? It says he had bodies. So he had, you know, when you've got lots of money, you've got lots of friends. Yeah. And none of the friends are going to say, hey, mister, you're doing the wrong thing. Pack your bags and go back home. Now they're going to say, we so blessed you have you. We don't know where you've been all our lives. Like, we're so glad we met you. Come another round of drinks down here. More food down here. Let's buy this. Let's buy that. They're all having a good time. They're singing and dancing. They're singing your praises. It looks like you're in the world of God. You know, he must have been thinking, I did the right thing now. You see? This is, this is the life. I'm living it up now. I did the right thing. But eventually the Bible says he began to be in one. The money ran out. And when the money runs out, the friends run out. And when the friends run out, the good times run out. But still, he did not come to his senses. He stayed where he was at. And then he eventually started working for the people that should be serving him. He started working for them. Listen to the scripture, Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 to 48. It says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart, in all your abundance. You will serve your enemies, the Lord will send against you famine, thirst, nakedness, and destitution. These things are our enemies. When we get out of the will of God, we begin to serve the things that should be beneath us, that should be serving us. We begin to serve our enemies. And this is what happened to the prodigal son. He began to serve his enemies. You see, the prodigal son had to come to his senses. Now let me tell you a story about someone else in the Bible that 
will conquer the will of God. Let me speak to you a bit about Naomi. How many of you know the story of Naomi? She's found in the book of Ruth. So Naomi, her, her husband and her two sons left the land of Israel in search of greener pastures in a place called Moab. And there her husband passed away in the process of time. The sons eventually married local women. So can you see this was happening over time? It didn't happen in one day. It was a period of time they lived there. They must have said this is the right thing to do. Stayed there for a while, the husband died. It still did not dawn on her that we are out of the will of God. My husband has died prematurely. They stayed on. Eventually the eldest son died. So she stayed on. Eventually the youngest, the lost son died. And then Naomi came to her senses. But I want to, I want to just dwell on this for a while. You see, she realized somewhere along the line that they had made a mistake in choosing Moab. Instead of staying in the land, in the place, and in the will of God for their lives. She realized they made a mistake. But watch this. When she realized, I do not possess the power or the ability to fix this problem, she decided, I'll go back home and throw myself at the mercy of God. And I came up with this quote. Listen to this quote. Deception gets us into trouble. Pride is what keeps us there. Did you get that? So now let's get into this. She realized they made a mistake. But pride is what keeps you there. So you try to fix it so that people don't look at you and say, I think you made a mistake. But it's quite obvious you shouldn't have made this decision. You shouldn't have chosen that plan over this plan. That plan over God's plan. So you try and stick in it to fix it. But guess what? You just can't fix the problems. You just can't fix the things that just start to go wrong and wrong and wrong in your life. So she tried to fix things on her own until the lost child died. And when she looked at her situation, she realized, I don't have the power to fix all of this. What was I doing all these years trying to fix it up? Look, my husband died. My sons died. My one daughter in law left me. I'm down to one. Even Ruth. And she decided, I will go back home and throw myself at the mercy of God. Listen, church, what's going wrong is going wrong because you're out of the will of God. Do you know how many people find themselves out of the will of God and want to do warfare prayers? Curse the devil. Rebuke the devil out of my finances. Rebuke the devil out of my body. Get out of my home. Get out of this. But you invite me. When you step out of the will of God, you invite me in. This is your mess. And so we want to fast and pray, and we want to quote some scriptures, and some throw some scriptures at God, you know, where it says, Behold, I am the Lord thy God, I heal thee, I'll remove all sickness from the midst of thee. But you brought it up. You step out of the will of God, your healthy place, your wealthy place. Now you want to throw some scriptures up at God like he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. He will just fall out if you just lift up the scripture. No. Listen, what's going wrong is going wrong because you're out of the will of God. So like Naomi, we try to fix up in Moab. Fix up all the problems. Fix this up. Fix that up. Fix things. But here's the, here's the deal. If we could fix it, we will stay indefinitely out of the will of God. So God doesn't allow you to fix it. Despite how much you pray and confess, what you need to do is get back into the will of God. Hallelujah. It's so much more easier to get into the will of God than to fix up all what's going wrong in life. Get into the will of God and all the things that are going wrong will suddenly fix itself. And you'll be surprised and say, my help is coming back. Finances are coming back. I'm not hemorrhaging finances like before. Everything seems Get back into the will. 
of God, and it's amazing how quickly the loose ends will fix itself. But like the prodigal son, he had to come to his senses. Pride kept him there. The money ran out. That should have been the first sign. Let me pack my bags and hide at home. I've got my lost penny. Let me use it for bus fare to get me home. But no, pride kept him there. He thought, let me use my lost penny. Lost all of the dust. Maybe I'll make it good. I'll win me. Lost it all. Then he went and he served his enemies. And in the pig pen, you realize I'm still not getting enough. That's when he said, I will return and go back to my father. Listen to this. I need to speak to us about true repentance. Repentance must be sincere and genuine. When the prodigal son came home, he said, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. It's one thing to, to realize things are going wrong in life and then suddenly bring a prayer of repentance and say, oh, I'll quickly repent in prayer and I'll come before God and just ask God to forgive me. That's good. But the prayers of repentance must be sincere and it must be deep. The prodigal son realized when he said, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. He not only saw the error of his way, but he saw in his sin the effect it had on the Father. And that is when true repentance becomes true repentance. <clears throat> we need to begin to see how it affects the Father. It's not just about us repenting and saying, Lord, I'm coming home to you today. You know, I repent because I'm not poor. I've got nothing left. You only see yourself. You fail to see what it has done to him, how it has affected him. True repentance is seeing it from both perspectives. How it has affected your life, yes, and how it has affected him. So it's both sides. And so the prodigal son realized that he had sinned against his father as well. It's about seeing where you missed it. Are we getting that? We must be able to see where we've missed it. Whilst repentance is not effective, it's just surface, it's superficial prayers. Lord, forgive me, I'm not wrong. Because you can see there's a problem, an obvious problem. Either you help the way your finances. So we just pray these prayers, Lord, forgive me. But you haven't gone into the depths to see where have I missed it. And God wants you to see it. And the quicker you see it, the quicker your restoration and turnaround will come in your life. Amen. The depth of your repentance will determine the height of your revival. Listen to this. Long life is connected to his plan. But if we veer from his plan, the good news is we can get back on track. Jeremiah 29, 11 speaks about the good plan of God that he has for us. He has formed the plan. Just follow him into the greatness of his plan. You don't have to do great things. God is great, and He simply does great things. Amen? So how do you stay in the will of God? This is important to us as we begin to line up the runway here for us. So how do you stay in the will of God? By constantly tweaking and tuning the will of God for our lives. Listen to this and we'll qualify it. Colossians 1 and 9. We ask God, Paul is praying for the church at Colossus, he says, We ask God to fill you with the knowledge of His will, with all wisdom and understanding that His Spirit gives. Fill with the knowledge of His will. This, this should be our prayers personally. And this, these are the prayers we pray for you to be filled with the knowledge of His will. So, how do you stay in the will of God? By constantly tweaking and tuning. What do I mean by that? Many of you are drivers, drive motor vehicles, licensed. Have you ever driven down a straight road? The road is as straight as the boulders and as the guys who prepared it can make it. It's straight. There's no left, there's no right. But have you noticed as a driver that in order to keep the car on the road, you constantly got to move the steering wheel? You constantly got to move it. The road isn't turning. The car isn't turning. But you constantly got to do that. However slight. 
Maybe they've come a little too late. So they cannot land. So the ATC puts them in a holding pattern where they go round and round until the runway winds up for them. May God put us in a holding pattern if we have missed him. So that we can go round and round, get things right until the runway winds up for us. I don't want to be like, like flight MH370 that went right off the radar, right off until no one heard from them again. And tragically, many Christians have fallen into that same dilemma. <coughs> I'll share a little bit of that as we bring things to a close. And uh, as you know, in the month of September, we celebrate or acknowledge the Feast of Rosh Hashanah. It starts on the 15th. And if you understand the essence of the feast, it's the Jewish New Year. So can I just say this without being controversial? It's not the Jewish New Year, it's our New Year. It's not like the Jews are separate to us. It's God's feast. So I know we celebrate the new year come January 2023, but this is the start of the new year. So what better way to start it than to say, Lord, I'm starting it by being, by being in line with the will of God. I'm bringing my life into alignment with the will of God as we seek to enter into the new year of Rosh Hashanah. Amen. And we serve the God of the second chances. Listen, in John 10 and 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Please understand that we have been redeemed from the curse. You are now under the blessing. But you can relocate yourself under the curse. You can bring yourself by your actions, by your decisions, by stepping out of the will of God, bring yourself under the curse and suffer the consequences of it. Amen. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, God prepared Pass for us beforehand so that we should walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us. Your healthy place is in the will of God, your wealthy place is in the will of God. Amen. Now, listen to these two quotes that I put, to, put together. Nobody ever died. From doing the will of God. But so many people have died from steering out of or away from the will of God. Can you take this on that? The will of God is not going to kill you, it's an actual fact when I give you life. You want the Psalm 91 life with long life? Will I satisfy you and show you my salvation? Walk in the will of God. The will of God never ever killed anyone. Listen to the second statement. Nobody ever got poor from serving God and honoring God with their time. But in actual fact, there are people who have fallen into want who have stepped away from doing God's will. Example, the prodigal son and the only for that man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Listen to this. You don't arrive at the good life by wishing and praying it into existence. You arrive at the good life by obeying God and following His lead. And you have to do this on a regular basis. Have to do it on a regular basis. Isaiah 1 and 19 says, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. God knows where the A grade stuff is kept. And in every generation, God got a place called Goshen. For natural Israel, it was a place. But for us, it's a quality of life. Amen. We must be deliberate about knowing and doing the will of God for our lives. Let me just share this thing. I hope it will minister to you. It sounds a little horrific, but I hope and truly hope it ministers to you. You know, when we started out, it was many years ago, over 30 years ago in Jewel Street, what was it, 266 Jewel Street? I think that's what it was. We started out there, came to the Lord, got into church, but more than getting into church, we got into the will of God. We met people, this guy, in charge of praise and worship, and he was in charge of youth, and we watched these people in front of us, and they were in position, and they were married, and they had good lives, and they had good cause, and they had children, many of them. And over the years, we parted ways. Some of them left the church, we stayed on, for over 18 years at the same church, same minister, and we watched as others came and others went. And then from time to time, we meet the old people, not, not any 
anyone here today now? <laughs> we meet the old people that we used to know. And then they're talking to them. And they'll start telling you. No, I went through a divorce. We asked, where's Susie? Let's excuse me, not Susie was this one. Where's Susie? No, I divorced Susie. No, we went through a divorce. No, this woman did this to me. No, the husband did that to me. No, this went wrong. How's your business? No, that's all enough. This is what happened. That won't happen. But you were in praise and worship. Have you done any CDs? Have you done any music? Have you done? No, things just went down. And they so proudly telling you all the things that are gone wrong. It's like you must sit and throw them off the rock. And it's all because of this. They've stepped out of the will of God. They started well, as I said, but many don't end well. It's like listening to a horror story when you listen to these people that you haven't seen in a while. It's all just going downhill. And there's only one reason for it. They step out of the will of God. Church, I want to encourage you to stay in the will of God. Amen? Now listen to this. The book of Proverbs says, The path of the just is as a shining light, shining brighter and brighter unto a perfect day. Amen? Praise God. And your latter shall be greater than the former. You must be growing up and going up in the Lord. You must be getting stronger and you must be getting better. That's God's plan for your life. It mustn't be getting worse. If it is, there's something wrong. And I'm not talking to someone that's like a Naomi now, yeah, who went off in a particular direction and your life is just spiraling down here slowly, slowly, slowly. You need to get to the point where you say, I need to pack up and go back to my father. For some people, it's a geographical location. For others, it's a spiritual change in which you get back to God and you say, Lord, I'm coming back to you. Whatever your will requires, I lay my life down before you. I want to do your will in my life. That's the prayer we need to hear. That's the prayer we want you to pray. We you say, Lord, I'm rededicating my life to you. Amen. Glory to God. You see, if we get off course, here's the good news. We can get back on track. Ever travel with a GPS? It says turn left here and you turn right. And it says recalculate. Make a left, make a left, and it brings you back on track. God's got his own GPS system. Aren't you grateful to God for that? Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter how many times you miss the road, miss the turn, God knows how to bring you back on track. Why? Because he knows the plan. He knows the he knows how to get you there. Many times we take it upon ourselves. We say, no, Lord, I'm just making a right to you. Yeah, I'm making a left. We end up making a mess of our lives. Let's allow God's GPS to get you back on track this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Now remember, listen to this as we close. God's grace is bigger than your mistake. God's grace is bigger than your mistake. Doesn't matter how many times you mess up, He can fix it. But I need to issue this disclaimer. How God restores you is up to Him. How God restores you is up to Him. We need to just say, Lord, I delight to do Your will. I delight to do Your will. And I'm reminded of the story of a preacher who was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, was diagnosed with cancer and they gave him so many months to live. And so he came back home. And he said, the first thing he said to the Lord is this, he said, Lord, I know you don't miss it on your side, but we miss it on our side. And he said, Lord, I'm a preacher, I'm a man of the clock. I can't tell you where I've sinned or how I've sinned, but if there's a problem, it's on my side, not on your side. So will you show me where I've missed it? And the Lord showed me several areas where he missed it. It was the sin of omission, things he was called to do that he failed to do. He repented immediately and God said, in 30 days' time, you'll be cured. Didn't take any medicine. Doctors gave him a diagnosis. God just showed him where he went wrong. He repented. He went on day 28 to have himself tested. And they found out that he was completely cured of cancer. No trace of cancer. Listen, we have missed it on our side. It's not God who's missing. We must. And we need to pray the prayer. Lord, show me where I must it. You see, God has the right to direct, and then He has the right to redirect us. Good intentions can lead to your downfall. Good intentions can lead to your downfall. 
Here's what God is saying. This is what God is saying. Hallelujah. Psalm 65 verse 11 says, Lord, you come the hill with your goodness and your parts drip with your abundance. Can I say this to you? The plan of God with all its blessings, all its provisions, is waiting for you. You're willing to walk in the plan and the path. God is here on for you. Come and spread. Father, this morning, as we submit this message and the people to you this morning, it is our prayer that you will take every repentant heart, every prodigal son that has prayed, every nail.